Good morning, everyone. I, I know uh, we've had exciting discussions and I can see everybody interacting, but I'm going to ask just for a few minutes of your time. Um, and I promise you with such a, a distinguished panel around me, we're not going to bore you. Um, we are still continuing along the same lines of um, training and education. And as you will see, um, you know, the panel in front of you does, needs no introduction because most of us have already heard them. I think Laurie and I are the only ones who are sitting here for the first time. Um, so without further ado, we're going to uh, kick off. And um, if the panel doesn't mind, I'm going to go according to the listing. And I see I'm supposed to be first on the list. So I'm going to kick off and then um, Michelle's going to be the one to crack the whip. <laughs> um, basically, what I'm going to be looking at is training psychiatrists in under-resourced areas. For those who don't know, I already mentioned yesterday that I'm from a different country from here, from this province. I'm from a, a country called the Eastern Cape, where things happen a bit differently. And within the Eastern Cape, there's only one medical school for seven million people. And, um, you know, uh, therefore it means any psychiatrist who has to qualify in the Eastern Cape has got to go through our hands. And I had the department which I took over from um, Prof. Uh, Alonzo um, about a year ago. And quite frankly, um, the job always looks easier when you're outside until you have to walk in and take it over. Um, the biggest challenge we have in the Eastern Cape is that the furthest site where you still have to run a department is 530 kilometers from the central mother site. And uh, by that I mean uh, we've got the university and the medical school situation in Numtata, which is very rural. And then we've got five sites which are spread across the province. That includes as far as Port Elizabeth, which is way down south and slightly to the um, west of Humtata. It also includes Grahamstown, it includes Queenstown, it includes East London. And basically, you have to have tentacles, like an octopus, which reach out to all of these areas in order for you to be sure that you're doing the correct thing. Um, and um, what we find is that whether we like it or not, not all sites are as uniform as we would prefer. Some are more rural, some are more urban. Um, but in addition to that, we've got uh, challenges dealing with the Eastern Cape Health Department, which is supposed to provide an adequate clinical training platform. And they don't always do that, which forces you to be resourceful. So what do we then do to try and address that? Um, well, we've ended up having to partner with some institutions outside of the province. Examples are we've got um, the child psychiatrist, Anusha, who spoke just now, who's training our um, uh, registrars in child psychiatry. And so far, she's doing a great job. Thank you, Anusha. We've had to partner with um, provinces uh, like UKZN, and I see Bongi Mashap who's sitting in the audience. We've sent some of our registrars there as well. And what then happens is while they are away, the same clinical and academic load that they uh, were carrying within the province is carried outside the province. But, of course, it leaves the clinical service platform one short or two short, depending on how many people are actually rotating outside. And what it therefore means is that for a four-year period while the registrars are training, they have to accept that at some point they're going to be training with uh, one less or two less people on the platform, which means they therefore have to take on more work. Um, and then um, if one looks at issues of access to um, the internet in order to support them in their research, that's also a major, major challenge because it's completely unreliable. Um, list of all, because uh, while you're still working on your project on your computer, if you're sitting in Umtata, the electricity can go at any time, any point. And, um, you know, if you are lucky enough to have internet access, then it means it will be unreliable because of that. But one of the uh, challenges we also found was that uh, with a university like Walter Susulu, there is no guarantee that even though you're training there, you will get internet access. So what do you do then? 
if you want to be accessing um, you know, similar resources to your counterparts who are sitting in other universities. There isn't much you can do except try and be resourceful. Um, if you're lucky, you will know another registrar in another province where you might say, listen, um, you know, I'm looking for this particular study by this person because I did it for ABC. And you know, um, if you are able to then get that through your own means, Nobody's going to clap you on the back and say, hey, you did a great job, because nobody's going to ask you how you got it. They just want you to be able to produce. Um, but in spite of all those challenges, I can mention quite a few opportunities. And the opportunities um, have to do with registrars who are actually forced to cope in any environment. They also um, are able to be innovative and, and, and resourceful because um, they have to be able to produce a product similar to other registrars in other provinces without necessarily having the same resources. And what is nice about it is that in spite of all those challenges, we do have registrars who qualify. Um, we've been accredited to train um, psychiatrists fully from um, 2010. So this is our sixth year um, of training registrars. And within that time, we have been able to produce some um, with um, one who eventually became a child psychiatrist. Sadly, she, uh, we lost her to Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, we also have been able to produce one who has now um, managed to get his PhD as well. So in spite of the challenges, I feel we are actually uh, making some headway. And um, you know, my belief is that we are going to get there in spite of the um, challenges. And I think some people actually choose to come to us. They will say, you are my first choice because <coughs> you're gonna be able to provide me with a very different experience to what I would expect to get if I go anywhere else. I know for a fact, uh, looking at my friend in the room, uh, Dr. Sophie Dela, that at one point we com competed for the same registrar. And surprise, surprise, she actually chose to come to us. <laughs> and, and what is nice about that is it encourages you to, co to, encourages you to continue in spite of the challenges. And there's quite a few things we have to look forward to. One of them is the fact that we get a unique profile of um, patients in some instances which is not seen anywhere else. And that provides an opportunity to learn, a great opportunity to learn. And sitting to my left is Greg, who has since been convinced after a conversation yesterday that it's worth coming to visit our campus. I won't say over what exactly, all I'll say is it's, it's quite unique. And in that instance, therefore, it, it makes one proud to be part of uh, the Walter Sisuli University in spite of the challenges. And with that, I'm actually going to end there. Um, in terms of um, the next person on the list, who was here. Hi there, I'm going to build on those wise comments I made in the first uh, panel uh, to talk about global uh, mental health education. It's a big topic and chosen to focus on three papers, one um, uh, by colleagues Ann Becker and Arthur Kleinman that was in the New England Journal in 2013, another which uh, was in The Lancet in 2010 by Buta and uh, uh, Julio Frank and others, and then one that uh, Christina Borba and Atale and Tashome Chivray and Dave Henderson and I did in the Harvard Review of Psychiatry. Okay, so this is an enormous challenge. We all know that. And um, trying to provide mental health services to low and middle income countries. And it's really going to require a revolution in uh, medical <coughs> and mental health education uh, in, in the 21st century. And um, Ann Becker and Arthur Kleinman point out that the size of the healthcare workforce just doesn't meet the needs. And there's a big human resource gap. About a million um, mental health workers are needed um, in low and middle income countries if you don't really have. Uh, so what is that going to mean for medical education in the 21st century? Um, and so these wise uh, uh, um, uh, medical educators got together and uh, they published this report on education of health professionals in the 21st century, taking a global perspective, a systems approach, and really hitting away at the need for multi-professionalism, interdisciplinary training of uh, physicians. And they see this as a really a major transformative opportunity for, for medical education worldwide, but it's going to require a big change in vision and, um, and educational institutions are going to have to join forces to try to 
change the paradigm. Uh, because we actually produce about one million doctors, nurses, midwives, public health professionals annually around the world. And there's maldistribution, we all know that. India has a lot of medical schools. Uh, um, China has a lot, the United States has a lot. But um, aside from that, uh, it does occur there's one medical school for the East Cape. Uh, so we have to do a better job of, of spreading the wealth in terms of medical education. And again, I want to emphasize this is transdisciplinary um, because doctors are going to need to have to work uh, with other disciplines if we're going to cover the, the, um, the globe. Uh, no, we also, we've already talked about the large disparity in health expenditures around the world. Um, so this, this provides us with a challenge but also an opportunity. And the recommendations are that yes, and you know, we're all on board with competency-based uh, education and curricula that are required. But we have to hit away at this idea of interprofessional and transprofessional education. And that's really the need to better operationalize uh, the concept of task sharing uh, around the world to meet the needs. We have to make better use of information technologies, obviously. And we have to do a better job of taking what we know globally around the world as far as this body of knowledge that exists on PubMed, et cetera, and bringing it locally to try to come up with local answers to local um, uh, questions. And, um, and then the twinning partnerships that we heard about um, from Atelier and others yesterday that can be very productive as models for uh, educating uh, mental health providers. And of course, strengthening educational resources, so better syllabi uh, and didactic materials and infrastructure and doing a better job of meeting the supply and demand needs. We have to change from academic centers to academic systems and move out into communities and, and uh, using communities as, as sites of learning. We have to build alliances and collaborations, inviting in governments and NGOs to help with the educational mission. And again, um, um, uh, designing twinning relationships uh, that uh, make the most sense and are most powerful. Of course, we're going to need leadership, we're going to need investments, and we're going to need to get together and, and join forces for um, uh, building better strategies. Now, I want to make some kind of personal comments about medical student education and about education of primary care physicians. And I'll end here. Basically, um, uh, what I've observed in my time in academic medical centers and medical schools is that um, uh, the physician, the physicians in training who come to medical school sometimes believe that they can uh, carve out psychiatry. So when they're rotating on psychiatry, it's like, okay, I can take a vacation. I'm not going to need this, okay? And, and uh, you know, um, I don't need to get an A in this course, and that kind of thing. That no longer is acceptable, okay? So for medical students, we have to hit away at the importance of psychiatry. We know this. Dr. Satcher, the global burden of disease, of mental health is essential for general health. Um, we also know this um, from the NCD world itself. You can't separate neuropsychiatric disorders from the other NCDs, cardiac disease, cancer, diabetes, um, uh, et cetera. In fact, they account for 30% of the NCDs. So it's like ridiculous for medical students to believe that they can carve out psychiatry. There's no, and, and this is why I think in primary <coughs> care doctor education, we have to demand that primary care doctors get more psychiatry training. Um, it, you know, collaborative care, I'm all for it, but as a transitional approach, it's interim. That's not the answer. We don't have collaborative care nephrologists. We don't have collaborative care cardiologists. Psychiatry is a medical discipline, and so physicians have to take responsibility for taking care of psychiatric patients. They can no longer say, oh, this is, you know, I can't do that, or I don't have time for that, because this is what their patients are coming to them with. <coughs> and we're not going to be able to cover the world until that becomes part and parcel of primary care uh, doctoring education. And if it means that we accept different people into medical school, who say, in fact, that may be question number one, are you willing to take care of psychiatric patients? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, 
in, in terms of medical student education. If they say, oh no, I want to be a cardiac surgeon or I don't want to take care of psychiatric patients, then okay, try something else. We, we can tell that Greg is very passionate about it, but time's so anyway, up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, next up is Lori, uh, who's going to do her thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I feel like, full disclosure, I am not a psychiatrist, psychologist, I am a biostatistician. So numbers are very important to me, so I will stay on time. <laughs> okay, so first I want to thank every, um, well, thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm going to take a slight left turn, although I do think, um, uh, Greg, thank you, uh, leading right into what I want to talk about. So there's been a lot of talk about training clinicians and psychiatrists and, and caregivers, etc. And I'm going to uh, switch a little and talk about training researchers. So uh, a colleague of mine, um, Victoria Demena, will speak uh, soon about this uh, the Stanley Institute at the Broad in Cambridge, Massachusetts has a big initiative to further genetic research around the world. Up until now, it's been primarily people of um, European descent. We want to include people from all over the world. We would like the map of geneticists and data within genetic studies to actually represent the world <coughs> population. Um, and that's the goal of the Stanley Center's project in partnership with the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Uh, where I come in is that recently we had the big international American Society of Human Genetics, although that is an international society, meeting. And the first slide that was presented by the director of the American Society was a map of the world. And he was very proud. He said, look at all the researchers that are represented in this conference. There's about 5,000 people at that conference. Beautiful map of the world. Everything that's represented was all in green. And then you see the continent of Africa. You've got a green spot here and a green spot in the south, and then the rest of it is white. So that's where I come in. I don't like that. I want to take my little crayon, and I want to start coloring that in. And that's what we're going to try to do. So in partnership with our research program, where we're expanding the research to multiple countries, we also want to expand the training of researchers in these countries. We don't want to come in, do our research, and do everything back at our institute in, in Boston. That's never been the goal. What we want is we want to bring the researchers with us. And I don't mean bring them to Boston, I mean bring them up. We've had a lot of advantages where I come from, where um, a lot of foundational uh, education that has allowed us to get to the point where we mapped the human genome. And what I want to do is bring um, the African researchers to that same point where they're coming along with us, they're developing the methodologies, they're building the studies within Africa, staying within Africa, and building that capacity here. So we propose doing this in what I, I think of as a, a slightly different way than what I've been familiar with before. I, I've actually been teaching for about 20 years now. Um, the last five years in <coughs> Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've taught amazing students. And I've had students from 32 countries, I think, total, have been in my classes, mostly biostatistics and, and programming, et cetera. And they've been great. They've got, you know, they come in, they're so enthusiastic, they want to learn, and it's fabulous. And then they go back to their institution and they sit down and there's 400 messages in their inbox. And there's somebody down the hall coming to ask them questions. And then somebody finds out that they took a biostat class, which then made them into the new biostatistics expert in their institution. Okay? Which is unfortunate because then they don't get to do their own research and they get overwhelmed and they don't have the support within their institution. So I want to change that. So instead of focusing on individual classes and focusing on individuals, we want to focus on partner, partnering with different institutions. And the Stanley has partnered with five different institutions in our, our pilot of this in the next two years, um, where we want to bring in trainees um, into a program where they're coming from institutions that have support. So these are institutions that we're already building our collaborative research projects with. So their supervisors have a vested interest <coughs> in these trainees to succeed because they need people to help them with these big projects. These projects are, you know, we're looking to get tens of thousands of people into these studies. We want to build these huge studies and massive databases to be able to analyze. So they have a vested interest in their trainees to develop skills in neuropsychiatric genetics and epidemiology. So we're going to bring those trainees together for workshops. We're going to talk about epidemiology. We're going to talk about ethics. We're going to bring in experts on um, the world of genetics, the world of computation. I, 
my background is, is computation. Um, we're gonna, it, so obviously I tend to gear a little bit more towards the computational side, but we're bringing in people from all these different areas, um, teaching about epidemiology, how to build these big studies, how to maintain them, and how to analyze them. And then for the next year and a half, we have weekly mentoring sessions. So they go back to their institution, where they're not the only trainee there, there will be multiple trainees at each institution. Every week we'll get together virtually from all the trainees across all the institutions, talk about our projects, bring in experts. Um, basically, when they get back and they see the 400 emails in their inbox, 100 of them are going to be from me, which is probably true. So, but we, we're not going to let them forget us, because that's, that's what ends up happening. You get overwhelmed, right? So we're not going to let them forget us. We're going to keep at it, and then a year later we'll have more workshops, and we'll have a workshop on grant writing, with the whole point of this is starting a project, bringing it to fruition, and at the end, starting to push out grants. Push out career development grants. We want to build these people to build a career in neuropsychiatric research. One of the benefits I know that I've had in my life, and I've asked colleagues as well, like, how did you get to where you are? How do you credit where you got? We had a society of people, we've had a circle of people that have supported us. Not just mentors above, but colleagues around us, and then also students below us. So a big aspect of this program is not just training, oh, I lost it. Not just training um, the trainees, but bringing in trainees that want to teach. Oh, okay, I'm gonna talk really fast. Yes, it is. So we want the trainees to be able to teach. So we're not just um, looking for people who have support above, we're looking for people who want to bring up the next generation. So we are bringing trainees from Harvard and Broad, um, to the various sites, and we are working with the workshop participants and those to teach the skills on the site, to teach them how to teach, and to require them to be mentoring the next generation. So they should be bringing up the grad students so that when we leave, they can start teaching the classes, and those classes can be integrated into the curriculum. So I did I need it. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> you did do your thing. Next up. Um, is um, again uh, another gentleman who does not need any introduction and with that I hand over to you Ed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very <coughs> pleased to of course be back in, in Africa where we all come from um, and to address particularly this very important issue of training and education. Numbers are important to me too and I want to start with a few numbers. 14% of psychiatric disorders exist by age 14 worldwide. Uh, very few of those get detected in those first 14 years of life. 75 of psychiatric disorders exist by age 24 worldwide. Very few of those get detected unless there's some extraordinary events that brings it to our attention. There will never be enough psychiatrists to take care of these numbers. Only by task shifting and by working across disciplines will be able to meet and have equity to all those young people who need care and early prevention and intervention. A focus strictly on psychiatry to meet this demand won't work. We need competent psychiatrists, of course, but not to meet this extraordinary demand. 50% by age 14, 75% by age 24. So we need to be sober ourselves about it and think about how we're gonna enhance access to this extraordinarily large population I think Dr. Sacha has come up with one response. When we think about global health, don't think about everything else outside America. America is part of global. In fact, there are pockets in America that mimic the disparities and the lack of access to sub-Saharan Africa. And Dr. Sa Dr. Sacha had the vision of applying and successfully obtaining a very generous NIH grant to deal with those disparities. How do they deal with the disparities at the Sacha Institute? They don't deal by specialties. They deal with it in a transdisciplinary approach. The transdisciplinary approach, it is not a temporary solution. It is a, a solution for many decades to come. We are just beginning to develop transdisciplinary solutions to this burden of disease. Additionally, psychiatric disorders represent about 15% of the global burden of disease and 30 to 45% of the global burden of disability. So don't think only about global burden of disease, think about also global burden of disability. They lead, in fact, cardiovascular disorders and 
mental disorders together, lead together in the global burden of disease. And, not surprisingly, cardiovascular disorders coexist with depression and with anxiety. So dealing with them in separate silos by specialties won't meet the desired outcome. Collaboration, an example of transdisciplinary collaboration, is between psychiatry, public health, and cardiology. So I'm giving these as a preamble to the six minutes I have, but to hopefully engage in more detail with you. So uh, for the past eight years, I've pioneered in the American Psychiatric Association the idea of collaborative and integrated care, and uh, have frequent discussions on the subject with Dr. Satcher. I've been very privileged to, to have him by my side and often consult with him on, as to how to best approach the subject. And I'm happy to inform you that we finally developed a model. <coughs> we have it. You'll get it electronically uh, this morning, I hope. Yes, Joanna? Uh, how do we do it? The model we propose is, is very simple and it's very, very easily implementable across countries. You don't need high tech, you don't need Americans to come, but some training is required. And it's sustainable, by, not just by psychiatrists, but it's sustainable across disciplines. Nursing colleagues could be leaders in sustaining it, public health people could be leaders in sustaining it, psychiatrists could be leaders in sustaining it, primary care physicians could be able to sustain it. What are the elements of it? It's team-based, first. Second, uh, it is population-based. We don't only deal in seeing individuals, we do, of course, but you take responsibility for a whole population, whether it is a village or a city you look at, uh, or a country. Thirdly, it is measurement-based. We don't just give medications out and give some more medications and come to the next visit. We measure whether, in fact, there's a response to our intervention. And those measurements are done on a regular basis, namely at least on a one to two month basis. Measure the response to the intervention. Fourthly, uh, it is evidence-based. We use interventions that are proven to be effective. And uh, fortunately, we have a few that, that are effective. And lastly, uh, we have an, an accountability for quality improvement. Accountability that is a shared accountability. Accountability by those who receive the care and accountability for those, by those who give the care. I'd like to conclude with, say, with a vision to the future and why this is important. It's not just a transitional phenomenon, the collaborative integrated care. We're on the cusp of extraordinary scientific discoveries that will inform how we do things in health, public health, and in medicine. Those research initiatives focus on a number of transacting systems in our body. Our body is not a series of silos. Our body, in fact, reflects the model we need to adopt in our practice. It's a series of organs and systems that interact with each other, what integrated by the brain. That model, integrative collaborative model, is our body. Our practice should reflect our body, not the other way around. Why I'm so excited about it, if you detect an, an arrow of excitement, is because we're on the cusp of extraordinary scientific discoveries that will in fact confirm this. The brain research project, the interaction between the brain and the heart, the brain and the immune system, and the brain and the microbiome. And I'll end with an anecdote. I learned to say stories from Dr. Sachs. 30 seconds. <coughs> As a young man, a Romanian young man moving to America, I heard the expression, I have a <coughs> gut feeling. I said to myself, a gut feeling? How could you have a gut feeling? The feeling would come from the heart, maybe the brain, but the gut? <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> well, in the 21st century, I learned that there is an intimate feedback loop between the microbacteria in the gut and the brain. So one could have a gut feeling. Thank you very much. <laughs> time for questions and um, I'm going to ask for help in moving the mics around if possible. Thank you. And we've got our colleagues from Jamaica. <coughs> Thank you. I, I really want to bring a message from an underdeveloped island country to the mother country of Africa. I really want to bring this message. In 1948, 
our university was set up in Jamaica. It was the only university. Since that time, we have developed four universities in the Caribbean. We have trained 5,000 doctors, most of whom are working in North America. In Jamaica, we have 3,000 general practitioners across our island for 3 million people. Psychiatry was started in 1965. We started with three psychiatrists when I started working in 1970. Now we have 40 psychiatrists. Now we have 150 psychologists, all of which have been trained in Jamaica, by Jamaicans, for Jamaicans, with Jamaican technology. I heard a gentleman from, from Harvard, it's Dr. Fishon, is it? Who, who, well, I certainly knew Chet Pierce very well. The, the reality is that we have been treating psychotic patients in, in open medical wards of general hospitals for 45 years. And we have an experience now where we don't treat psychotic patients in mental hospitals. We treat them in medical wards, beside diabetes, beside hypertension, beside all the medical conditions you have. And in fact, all our medical graduates have to practice psychiatry. It is the main issue of health in Jamaica at this moment. We are now moving into the era of primary prevention in psychiatry, and all the doctors and all the nurses and all the health professionals are involved in this fight against the huge problem of the mental health issues in the country. And I really would like to say, especially to the, the lady from the Cape State, hey, don't worry about being the only one, because you have to start with one. Yeah, we started with one, yeah, and we are now at a place with just three million people where we are competing with the United States in terms of what the quality of care that we can give. And we, we know that that's a reality. Elliot Sarrell can tell you that. We, he and I have written a book together about this issue. So in other words, we are clear that there needs to be a South-South collaboration. We have trained 100 people from Habroni, from Botswana, in medicine at the University of the West Indies. And we, we, are, we are going to collaborate about setting up a postgraduate training institute in, in psychiatry, in health, in <coughs> medicine, in Africa, from the University of the West Indies. Let's have a South-South collaboration. Thank you very much for that. Uh, questions, comments? Pearls of wisdom. Hi, uh, my name is Joanna. I'm the student of Dr. Sorrell, um, and I have two questions. Um, since we're talking about education and wondering how, and from this room, it, there is a fair distribution of female and male psychiatrists and scientists or researchers and politicians. Um, <laughs> But how is it, how is gender equality in terms of mental health profession or the health profession, um, you know, across the African continent or even in the United States? I know there's a gap between, um, like, it, it is still a male dominated profession, um, but how is it in Africa? Um, and what kind of policies were, you know, since we're talking about outcomes, um, can we reach in terms of that? And then a second question is regarding affordability of medical school or medical profession to be trained to become a psychiatrist. Um, I know in the US, becoming a doctor is very expensive and a lot of it comes to student loans. How is that in Africa? And I don't know if um, any of you know about this, but it's, it's been, there has been protests. Um, it's called, it's called um, Fees Must Fall. Fees must fall, um, must fall movement in South Africa is regarding you know, university students eliminating um, school fees, especially like universities. But how is that going to play in terms of you know being a medical student? Okay, thank you very much for those interesting questions. Um, I think the first issue, I can mostly speak for South Africa, but we've got colleagues from across the continent who can comment. 
gender equality in psychiatry, um, you're correct, it's been a very male-dominated field, but what's very interesting is when we sit and do registrar interviews these days, the majority are women who are coming through uh, for different reasons. Um, I'm not an expert on the reasons, but I can tell you more women are coming through. In terms of policies which are in place, we do know that there is an affirmative action policy. It only kicks in when um, you've got two equal candidates in everything <coughs> else, and then you would look at the affirmative action. And obviously, if you are female and you are um, black, then you are um, basically given an extra score for that. And the main reason is because of uh, trying to um, uh, equalize what has been unequal for so long. Um, so, uh, and then in terms of what happens once you're qualified, it really <coughs> depends. If you go into academia, it is still very much male dominated, but what is wonderful to say is that I'm sitting with another female head of department. Uh, I'm looking at Professor Seeded. So you can see that's changing as well, because I'm, um, I'm the second one. I'm looking at other potentials in the room and hoping they're gonna go and make the third and the fourth. <laughs> and they know who they are. <laughs> so that's definitely changing. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a view from the floor saying two is enough. <laughs> so thank you very much for that question. And then the second question is actually um, something that's very much in the news. I think all of us are aware of it. Fees must fall. Um, it's been expressed in many different ways. We support a lot of what the students are saying. It's just how they're getting the message across, which is a huge issue at the moment for us. Destruction of property and stopping other people from having access to education. Um, that's a huge um, problem that uh, we need to deal with in some way. There are um, you know, counter arguments for that, and the arguments are if you've made it into university, you're actually more privileged than the person who hasn't made it to university. So why must you get uh, preferential treatment? But on the other side of the coin is that a lot of the people who are making it to university are not necessarily coming through. There's no throughput for that. And part of the issue is economic challenges. And the majority <coughs> of those who do not make it through university are actually um, black students. Um, uh, and therefore, the fees must fall issue is a huge one that we cannot ignore. What are we doing about it? Unfortunately, we're not having as much leadership in terms of Department of Higher Education as we would like. We therefore are not having clear solutions that are uh, addressing the problem. And as a result, you've got high levels of frustrations, um, lack of um, access to uh, resources that the students believe would lead them to um, qualify, uh, walking out with a, a qualification. And as a result, we are actually then forced to ask ourselves, what's going to happen next year and the year after? Interestingly, um, while all the other universities have been protesting, Walter Sisuli University has actually been back in class studying, we've had our exams, and part of the reason is because they protest every year, whatever else happens elsewhere, because of uh, problems with access to um, financial um, support. And as a result, uh, before all the other universities had started their protesting, they'd done it already. By the time the uh, wave reached the other universities, they said we'd had enough, we actually want to continue. So I don't think it answers your question, but yeah. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to ask Laurie a question. Um, you were speaking about flooding inboxes for your potential collaborators, and I wondered if you part of, you know, and you said following that there'd be grant funding, but the problem in under-resourced <coughs> areas is fact of the matter is people are you know, having to engage with service delivery issues and there simply isn't that protected time. So would you consider the, an earlier grant in order to negotiate or assisting those individuals to negotiate protected time in order to do this research? Because it's simply not enough to flood the inbox and have these weekly meetings. I felt overwhelmed for those individuals already just listening. <laughs> oh yeah, no, thank you for actually allowing me to clarify that. Um, we are, we don't want to poach um, the world of clinical psychiatry. Like, this isn't really our goal. There's a limited supply. I mean, we're, we're welcoming, welcoming them, but we're looking for people who really want to focus almost primarily on research. Um, and part of the reason that we're focusing on institutions, individuals within an institution, is because they are required to have protected time to do their projects as well. Um, the flood of the inbox was really trying to say that everybody else is trying to get a bit of their time and we want to be able to protect that and we want to give them the support that they need in order to focus on a project and to complete a project to, to fruition. And sometimes that support is just 
us, um, for lack of a better word, bullying their supervisors a little bit. Um, and showing them that you know there's really a benefit in having them focus on this research project that helps the institution, that helps that particular supervisor, that puts out papers, and then puts out grants to bring in money to then further the research and further what we can do. We don't want to overwhelm them. I mean, we've all been students at one point in our careers, I would imagine. Um, and so we, we definitely don't want to do that. We just want to give them that support system that a lot of people um, in, with my background tend to take for granted. Yeah. Usually, so, okay. Put out proposals, yes. We want to give them. No, no, I understand that's a big difference. Um, yes, um, we do, we, we are talking, it, uh, so this is uh, funded very generously by the Stanley Center um, at the Broad Institute. And there is talk about um, seed money once we get to the end, to give seed money, to do pilot projects, and then give them you know, workshops and help them through the writing process of putting out proposals. Um, one of the impetuses for thinking about that is, is a new mechanism at the NIH um, under the K grants that you can get um, career development grants for low, that are specified for low to middle income countries. And that's where we go, okay, we, those are the students that we want. We want the students that in a year from now are have the ability, we work with them to write these proposals. So yes, you're absolutely right. It is about some of the proposals. Okay. Yeah, I want to go on this issue of training, and the way I want to look at it is, yeah, I'm sure I need to introduce myself. My name is uh, <laughs> Dr. Simon Juguna. I'm the president of Kenya Psychiatric Association. I'm the director of mental health in Kenya. Uh, I've come in when you have been going on with this discussion on the issues of training and education, and basically trying to look at bridging gap in capacity and trying to do collaboration. And from the perspective on what we are doing in Kenya, I'm looking at it in terms of trying to see uh, there is a gap and we need to bridge this gap. And we need to have collaboration in trying to address this grand challenge. And the question we need to ask ourselves is looking at the demand and supply. We need to create the demand so that we have more training in psychiatry, and also training and education in mental health at the primary care level and the community. And what we are doing in Kenya is trying to see how can we package the whole aspect about training, which innovative models do we come up with? Because we need to have people coming to train and we need to repackage and come up with innovative models which are attractive so we have more people training. But then when we do that, how do we have resources to try to address this problem in terms of capacity building? So we need to look at, when we're creating the demand, we need to look at the practice of psychiatry and the aspect of integrating mental health in global health. And then we create the demand. Then we need to come up with innovative models which are cost effective so that we are able to use the minimal resources we have so that we can be able to bridge this gap. So to me, I think this is a time to act. For a long time we have been talking, it's my challenge to the academia, the people in the academia, have these programs, try to have the programs going on, and then maybe in some few years we should be talking about are we seeing results. Thank you for, I want to take a crack at responding to your very appropriate and very sharply defined question. Um, we have the evidence now that collaborative integrated care, the Cochrane Collaborative has done a review of 70 studies, 70, 70, that for every dollar invested in collaborative integrated care, there is a six dollar return. So I don't think we should continue to, I mean, we'll continue to debate, of course, but if you want to respond in an effective, clinically and economically effective way, to the demand that exists, the demand is huge. Maybe it's not always articulated because of cultural uh, norms or the people are willing to ask for it or not. But training the frontline people like the primary care physicians and the pediatricians to, to detect those conditions in the first 14 years of life 
saves a great deal of money from preventing later on in life the comorbid condition that manifests themselves in depression, cardiovascular disorders. So for every dollar invested in collaborative integrated care, there's a six dollar return. Right. Um, I'd be interested in uh, your thoughts, Dr. Zingallo, or the others in the audience, of what may be a best practice strategy kind of going forward <coughs> for a, um, an educational collaborative between uh, African American physicians in the U.S. and the National Medical Association and, and this group here. Uh, I'd share that uh, uh, three years ago, 2013, we would have raised about a half million dollars uh, and put on a series of three uh, trips. They start off as mission trips, uh, but the reality is, um, but there's of our doctors actually uh, went, provided care in Monrovia, Liberia, and I think all really recognized, although from a variety of groups of specialties, that psychiatry and mental health really was the signature area, I think, of need there, and perhaps other places as well. One of the struggles, though, is we're trying to leave um, a footprint going forward uh, that could be um, based on an educational collaborative. There really was just not enough infrastructure uh, to do that. Um, one of my take-home deliverables of this trip yesterday and today would hopefully be to go back with um, some ideas along that line, and Solid and I discussed it a bit last night, but I'd be interested in hearing if we were able to raise a half million dollars again and to bring docs of, um, associated with the National Medical Association uh, to the continent, what would be a best location to go? Because perhaps Liberia was so limited resources, it was really a difficult struggle for them to maintain when we tried to leave, uh, and what might be a best practice model to kind of link ed ed educational programs to several, I think, of the uh, uh, countries with health programs here. Um, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, well, uh, without um, blowing our own horn, um, I would say that Mtata, um, uh, where Walter Sisuli University is based, and of course, uh, Pretoria, where Sefako Makato University is based. Those are the two universities <coughs> within South Africa who are training psychiatrists but are known as historically disadvantaged universities. And in that, uh, we mean that um, in terms of resources from inception, they were always under-resourced. And um, as a result, therefore, I would say that those two universities would probably be of uh, uh, the ones who would benefit the most uh, from such um, interventions. And um, you know, if I look at my um, own um, department, I can tell you that one of our greatest weaknesses <coughs> is um, in the area of research. And the reason is because it was never something that was um, uh, properly resourced in terms of funding, in terms of um, uh, providing opportunities, and therefore um, with a recent change in the registration of psychiatrists requiring um, our trainees to actually um, produce a piece of, of research, that has put a lot of pressure on a department like mine to actually produce where um, we are still faced with a uh, lack of resources. So I would say if one way to take that opportunity forward, it would be um, uh, very beneficial for our department to actually focus on that in terms of training our, our registrars. And one of the advantages is once they're trained, they can actually train others. Um, I would actually ask uh, Prof. Um, Soli Ratamani to comment on this one because he's uh, from the second um, HDU. Yeah, I'd be happy to receive all the money. <laughs> Yeah, no, she is right, but I think, you know, we, we, we have to be open-minded about this. We have eight medical schools in this country, and uh, they have departments of psychiatry. There's a lot of research going on, and we benefit from exchanges, you know, uh, through our college, through our society of psychiatrists, and so on. But what is really true is what uh, Zuki said. Uh, there are still disparities, and they have to be addressed, and I think we've got to start there. Uh, if you come to our research meetings, There'll be some awards here, and they always go to people from the historically advantaged institutions because they have capacity, they have more consultants, and so on. Uh, so, so that's a reality, and uh, and that's also reflected in who passes the exam, the college exams, and so on. It's mainly people from the historically advantaged institutions because there are so many consultants who have uh, specific research niches and they ask questions <coughs> from the research niches and so on. So, so that's a critical issue. 
And I think our college is trying to address that by developing a blueprint for training. But I want to go back to the model someone uh, raised. Um, this question that someone from Kenya raised, it's critical. Uh, at the APA meeting in Toronto two years ago, we were looking with many other countries at uh, the models of training. We're looking at the length of training in psychiatry. Are we wasting time? Is there too much uh, information, information overload? Should we train people for three years, like in India? By the end of three years, there's the countries and Ethiopia. They've, they, they've done their part one and part two. They've done their research project, and they pass, and they go and practice as competent as clinicians. Uh, but then in other countries, it's four or five years of training, or even six, and people keep failing and failing. And they can't, I mean, in this country, to give you an example, we're still borrowing psychiatrists from Cuba who have to come and learn the language, who work in the one stream, and so on. So why should we be if you have eight medical schools that could train? Because our exams are difficult. There are candidates now in our exam system who are trying the exams for the sixth, seventh time. And you know, that, that's expensive, number one. Number two, it demoralizes people. If, if I'm head of department, I've been with a candidate, uh, a resident register for four or five years, and I think he's competent. Something, there must be something wrong, either with the candidate or with the exam process, you know? Or with the examiners themselves, I don't know. I suspect it's examiners more than anyone else. But what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> can, can, don't quote me at a college meeting. Right? <coughs> but the point really I'm trying to uh, ask of oh, you is help us look at cost effective you know, um, models of training that can produce competent uh, clinicians. Because we are now drifting towards working with traditional healers, with faith healers. It means as psychiatrists, we're not competent enough to produce our own, you know, to reproduce ourselves in good numbers to be able to cater for the various needs of psychiatry or mental health. And that's just about psychiatry. That affects psychology, it affects social work. I mean, a few years ago, I was in Ethiopia, and I found that there was no training for occupational therapists. There was no training platform for psychologists. And so these things are coming up now. And yet, uh, when you go to the US, South Africa, UK, you say your multidisciplinary team model must have all those people. But then there are countries that are coping without them, and, and, and how are they coping? You know? So I'm just raising this question to say, we need a reasonable, cost-effective model. Thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, take a shot at that. Thank you, thank you, uh, Zali, for bringing up the point that we, I think we have, we're reaching a point where we have to be creative our training models, and that's why I got a little passionate before. We are stuck in these in these uh, sort of encrusted views of what our specialties are. I'll give you an example. I, um, we have a fellowship in psychosomatic medicine, but we also have a fellowship in behavioral neurology. And what's been striking over the years is that um, clearly, uh, when you come out of psychiatry residency, you don't know enough neurology. Okay, it's just a given. And so we remediate our psychosomatic medicine fellows by teaching them a lot of neurology about brain structure and so on. And when they come to us, this is what they're craving. The, the neurologists who want to do behavioral neurology recognize that they don't know enough about psychopharmacology, treating behavioral uh, neurological sy syndrome. So this is an example of our failure in terms of medical education because we're stuck because of guild issues, because of stigma, with, oh, we have to train psychiatrists in this way. We have to train neurologists in this way. So that's one example, and that's why I brought up, it's time now, because of the challenge, 30% of NCDs, WHO, CDC, everyone knows that this is what's sinking us. World Economic Forum, um, with our School of Public Health, estimates that we, we're spending $47 trillion this is what NCD is going to cost, and that's just going to continue to go up. So I say this is clear, and we as, as academic physicians <coughs> should reconsider what, how we train doctors to meet the suffering that's out there, right? So yes, collaborative care is important, but I maintain that it's transitional. Someday there will be a medical education schema that will meet the needs that we see out there. And in terms of, of what I think we can do now is that 
if we were to say, okay, this is what the main problems are uh, in, in the world today in terms of, of diseases, because of metabolic syndrome, because of oxidative stress, because of lack of resilience and the kind of things that, that the, the physician from Jamaica was talking about, that let's try to build into primary care medicine um, uh, the, the ability, the capacity to take care of these problems that they're seeing. It's instead of building the structure around it to try to, um, you know, uh, 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 put a finger in the dice, so to speak. Um, I'm going to give one minute to Laurie, and then we have to shut down. Okay, <laughs> looks like two minutes. <laughs> okay, I, I will be fast, but I wanted to address. So I, <laughs> um, I wanted to address something that you brought up, and I thank you for it. You mentioned the students not passing the exams, and you said maybe the residents. The, is it the examiner? Is it the resident? Are they overburdened, etc.? And there's one aspect that you missed, which is the teachers, and that has been a passion of mine. Oh gosh, I didn't point. Um, the teachers. <laughs> Um, and that's actually my passion that got me into this. And one of the things that um, I, I've noticed and I've found is I have students say to me, well, I've taken a stats class, but I never learned anything until I sat in on this one. And it's about getting rid of the didactic process. It's about getting rid of the lectures. And it's about innovative teaching techniques that have come quite far in the last even decade of case-based teaching, of flipped classrooms, of peer-to-peer -peer teaching, and all these other buzzwords, which I'm happy to talk about what these buzzwords mean afterwards. Um, but it's not something that we can ignore, because I do think it's a benefit to the students and later on um, to the profession in general. I think that uh, it's beyond the scope of this meeting, but the residency is a bit late to think what you're going to do. It has to be in the core of medical education before you even decide which specialty you're going into. Uh, that's one aspect of it. The other, health needs to be an integral part of education that starts in pre-K and goes through K-12. Health in it needs to be an integral part of education, and regarding medical education, these issues need to be tackled long before you do graduate, postgraduate education. It has to be in the undergraduate level first and then later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, you've been very patient, including my panel over here. So um, looking at Michelle, our whipcracker, we have a break. Thank you very much. Thank you.